gentlemen, welcome to 5 by 15, the extreme aerobic workout for writers. Here we go. No, we don't. Next. <laughs> the Double Cross, the story of the D-Day spies. June 1944, 150,000 Allied troops amassed in southern England for the invasion. Everybody knows it's coming. We know it's coming, the Germans know it's coming. The question is, where is it coming? There are only two places on the north coast of France you can actually land that many people. Calais and Normandy. Calais is the obvious target, so the Brits and the Allies decided to go for the unobvious target next. The man in charge of doing this and of laying the deception that was codenamed Operation Bodyguard was a man named Tar Robertson, Thomas Argyle Robertson, better known as Passion Pants, on account of his, <laughs> of his uh, penchant for wearing tartan trousers. Next. Uh, Tar Robertson's job was running a committee called the Twenty Committee, so called because twenty in Roman numerals is the double cross. Uh, Tar was responsible for running double agents, of which there are a very large number in the Second World War. At the beginning of the Second World War, Germany poured spies into Britain. They came by boat, they came by plane, they came by parachute. Uh, several scores of them, and they were almost uniformly hopeless. Uh, some of them spoke no English at all and were promptly arrested on landing. The ones I'm about to tell you about tonight, whose code names were Treasure, Tricycle, Brutus, Bronx and Garbo, next, were of a slightly different sort. The man you've just seen, who's just disappeared from your uh, screen, was Agent Tricycle, whose name was Dushko Popov. He was an extremely dodgy Serbian businessman who was recruited into the German intelligence service by this man, Johnny Jebson, who was a senior Abwehr officer, German military intelligence. Uh, Popov landed in, in London in, about, in early 1942 and promptly defected to MI5 to become the first of the stable of double agents. Next. Uh, this is uh, Roman Czernowski. Roman Czernowski was a Polish fighter pilot and a trained intelligence officer who, after the fall of France, set up a large uh, network of spies in occupied France called the Inter Alia Network. When this was betrayed, he was arrested by the Gestapo and given a choice either to spy for the Germans in Britain or to face the firing squad. He took a very sensible decision, uh, which was to go along with the Germans. He landed in Britain and immediately became a triple agent for the British. Um, the only problem was that Tar Robertson wasn't sure that he wasn't about to become a quadruple agent and therefore gave him the codename Brutus. Next. Uh, this is my own favourite. Uh, this is uh, a bisexual Peruvian playgirl <laughs> with the unimprovable name of Elvira Concepcion Josefina de la Fuente Chaudois. She was the daughter of a Peruvian guano magnate from Lima. Uh, she was recruited by the Gestapo in a casino in the south of France uh, to spy for German intelligence and again defected back to MI5 and was given the codename Agent Bronx, the name of a particularly lethal cocktail. Uh, she, her job was to send false messages from Britain, uh, relaying conversations she had never had with people she had never met in British high society. Next. Uh, this is the star of the show, anyway. This is Agent Garbo, so called because of his unique acting talents. He was a failed Spanish chicken farmer who <laughs> volunteered to spy for the Germans and was duly taken on, but could only get as far as Lisbon, uh, whereupon he began to pretend that he was in fact in Britain by making up uh, stories about what was going on in Britain, a country to which he had never been. Uh, he got most of his information from the Lisbon Public Library and uh, began to send over a stream of information to the Germans, some of which was hilariously wrong, including the statement, I am in Glasgow at the moment, where they will do anything for a litre of wine. Uh, which was probably true, in fact. Uh, next. And this is Agent Treasure, the fifth of, of our team. Uh, she, in some ways she was the most valuable of the agents. She was a very highly strung uh, French woman of Russian origin who arrived in, in Madrid in 1943 with her pet dog, Babs, next. Um, now, Babs will play a very important part in this story because it turns out that Lily Segev, uh, Agent Treasure, was really only loyal to one thing and that was her dog, Babs. However, she did agree to spy for the British and duly turned up in Britain. Next. Now, in 1943, at the end of 1943, Tar Robertson made an extraordinary claim. Uh, he told Winston Churchill that all the German spies in Britain were under British control. Not some, not most of them, but every single one. Now, the strategic implications of this were very important because it meant that instead of simply using these double agents to catch more spies, they could be used to begin to relay false information to the Germans, specifically Operation Fortitude, which you see here, which was the attempt to persuade the Germans that instead of attacking Calais, the obvious target, 
The vast army, sorry, yes, instead of attacking Normandy, the obvious target, the, the, the troops were going for Calais. The, the whole point of this was to try to bottle up the massive 15th Army, 22 divisions which were assembled in northern France, in northeastern France. Next, what Tar Robertson didn't know, however, was that the entire double cross system, which these five spies would begin to implement, the attempt to persuade Germany that, that the main attack was coming in Calais, was being systematically betrayed to Moscow by Anthony Blunt. Blunt had two jobs. One was to assemble a short version of the double cross system, which went to Churchill, and then a much longer 20 page version, which went into the archives of MI5 and to Moscow. However, none of this was believed in Moscow because it was simply too good. Uh, the NKVD acted on the assumption that if it all made sense, then it must be a lie. Next. <laughs> However, problems were brewing. As the spies began to send over a vast amount of information, clearly indicating that Calais was the target and Normandy was safe, Treasure began to get extremely stroppy about her dog, which had been kept in Gibraltar in quarantine. Uh, she had been told that the dog would be brought over. In fact, the dog was not brought over, and she became increasingly furious about this. At Christmas 1943, she told her case officer, seen here, Mary Shearer, that she was going on strike, unless the dog was produced. However, at this moment, the worst possible thing happened. Uh, a telegram arrived from Gibraltar explaining that Babs had been run over by a truck. <laughs> Next. Initially, Lily Sergeyev seemed to take the news quite well. In fact, she was quietly furious. In her private uh, diary, she describes how she intended to get revenge. She went back to Lisbon, met up with her German case officer you see here, Emil Kliemann, and obtained a new wireless and wireless codes. However, she also obtained something called a control signal, which is something that all spies sent to, Ger sent to Britain by Germany had. This was a special secret message to be inserted into the wireless codes if they were controlled by the Germans. She did not tell her case officer that she had this. Next. And in her private diary she wrote, I could blow the entire system sky high. The implications of this are extraordinary. Had she done so, she would in fact have betrayed the entire D-Day secret. Because instead of reading her messages on Claire, they would have been read in reverse. Which would mean, of course, that instead of drawing attention away from, from Normandy, it would be clear to the Germans that that was where the invasion was going to take place. So they began to scan the intercepted radio messages of Bletchley for any evidence that she had in fact pulled off this, this deception. Just when they were, the, the, the temperature was beginning to come down over that, even worse news began to arrive. You'll remember at the beginning I described Johnny Jebson. He was the character who recruited Dushko Popov, Agent Tricycle, right at the beginning. Now, Jebson was an extraordinary man, completely unknown, really, to history. Uh, he was, uh, again, another playboy. He was extremely wealthy, but he was also vigorously anti-Nazi. He was a close friend of P.G. Woodhouse and had, in fact, been bankrolling P.G. Woodhouse in Paris by means of a forgery scam involving the Gestapo and the SS. Uh, he was, however, as I say, extremely anti-Nazi. Uh, and right at the beginning of his recruitment, Popov had said to his British handlers, if you can recruit Jebson, he will be himself an extremely useful double agent. This, in short, is what happened. Jebson was reverse recruited by MI6 and became agent artist. He began to produce a stream of extremely important information. He was actually the only spy the Allies had in senior German intelligence. He began to describe secret weapons productions, munitions numbers, morale, and most importantly, he began to describe the spies that Germany had <coughs> operating in Britain, or at least the spies that Germany thought it had operating in Britain. He gave chapter and verse on Treasure, Tricycle, Brutus, Bronx, and Garbo. When MI5 did not pick these spies up, Jebson made the obvious deduction. He worked out that every single one of these spies was a double agent. He therefore became privy to the D-Day secret. This sent a shock of panic through MI5, who realized that if he fell into the wrong hands, or if he decided to give up what he knew, he could in fact blow the entire deception sky high. Next. Sorry, back one. <laughs> On the eve of D-Day, six weeks before the landings, Jebson was kidnapped by the SS, bundled into a trunk, sedated, and driven to Berlin. For six weeks, the British spy masters didn't know whether he'd been arrested because of his dodgy business dealings, or whether in fact he'd been arrested because he was about to defect to Britain. They, had, they knew that in fact there were strong suspicions that Jebson was in fact a British spy. So for six weeks, before the landings happened. They had no idea whether Jebson under torture would give away the whole thing. Next. However, Operation Fortitude was a stunning success. 
The work of these five spies not only managed to keep the 15th Army bottled up in Calais for, a, for a 24 hours, which is what Eisenhower wanted, it managed to keep the army there for six weeks. The effect of this on, on the D-Day landings is obviously incalculable uh, in terms of numbers, but there's absolutely no doubt, and indeed all the main players concur, that had Operation Fortitude not worked, the La Allies landing in Normandy would have faced a bloodbath. Here you see the empty beaches of Calais, six weeks after Normandy. They're, they're still waiting, the army is still waiting for an attack that never came. Next. Here you see a captured map uh, captured about two weeks after D-Day, which precisely mirrors the attempts of, for, of Operation Fortitude to convince the Germans that British and American and, and, and Commonwealth troops were massed in southeast England waiting to attack Calais. Next. And what of Johnny Jepson? Johnny Jepson, as I say, was kidnapped. He was taken to Prince Albert Strasse, the Berlin uh, headquarters of the Gestapo. Uh, next. And he was put in a, in a solitary cell in the bottom of, of, the, of the Gestapo prison where he was horrifically tortured. Uh, we know that he was tortured because there are eyewitness accounts to what was done to him. However, he survived the torture and more than that, he never broke. He never told uh, his German um, torturers what he knew. He could have turned history in a completely different direction and he chose not to. At the end of the war, or shortly before the liberation of, of uh, Mauthausen concentration camp where he was held, Johnny Jebson was picked up by a Gestapo um, team and never seen again. Now, it's possible that he survived the war. Jebson had more reason than most um, to want to go underground. He had a lot of money, he could easily have done it. Uh, but it is much more likely that he died in the last spasm of violence that engulfed the Third Reich. Um, he did uh, apparently make at least two attempts to escape, but he was never seen again. Uh, next. So I leave you with this thought. Uh, Jebson was a flawed character. He, he was a, a person who could not resist uh, temptation, but he did manage to hold out against his Gestapo torturers to the end. And he is an extraordinary figure in many ways. Uh, he was not a conventional D-Day hero, but I submit to you that he was a hero nonetheless. Thank you very much.